I don't care what you do. Do whatever you get into. Just don't half-ass it. How about that? Like, leave it all out there. If you become a professional educator, if you become a cop who's a trainer, you be, whatever you do, just don't halfway do it. Hey, guys, if you missed out on the last conference in Nashville, Tennessee, you don't want to miss out on the next one. It's April 28th through May 3rd, Orlando, Florida, the Gaylord Palms Resort and Convention Center. You made a mistake missing the last one. You don't want that to happen again on this one. Five days of some of the best training you're ever going to experience packed into one event. We have an early bird special right now, $50 off. Use 24 early bird on our website, streetcop.com. Look for the conference. Click the link. Register today. If you want to get significantly better at this profession in five days, don't dare miss out on the 2024 Street Cop Conference. You know, you think about the last several dark years, you know, where our profession gets slandered a lot. But, you know, we're coming out of that. And I think, honestly, like in hindsight, all of the defund the police nonsense, I think I think that's been one of the better things for our profession, because in some places they let it run its course. And, you know, the experiment was a failure. Everywhere, everywhere that said, you know, we're going to we're going to defund or unfund or underfund, um, you know, fire the whole the whole police force um, because, you know, they are allegedly the problem. Well, that experiment has been allowed to run. And every single place that that has happened, crime went through the roof. Shocker. Um, and the police were called in to resolve the problems. And, I, you know, in 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 the next, you know, chapter of history. Nobody's going to try that again for quite a while because they realized, yeah, we tried it. It sounded like a great idea. It was an abject failure. So, you know, it's it's interesting. A lot of times things that we tend to think, man, that's the worst thing. Uh, you just kind of, you know, hang on, ride through it. And on the other side, you know, we're not out there standing on the street corner saying, I told you so. Um, but the, the experiment failed. I mean, shockingly enough, there is there is incivility. There's evil. There's, you know, just meanness. Um, you know, criminality. And you have to have some dividing line between all of that and civil society. And so, you know, that's, uh, you know, it sounds elementary, but we had to let the experiment run in certain places. And, you know, again, shocker, it was a failure. So, yeah. Some of us with brains, uh, maybe the two people on this podcast, at least I can call it for this moment, (laughs) uh, had a funny feeling this wasn't going to work out. And you know what? Well, you say that we were on out there saying, ha, 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 I told you so. Uh, I am. I mean, I do right, it all right. the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do fair. it on social media constantly. That's right. It's fair. It's exactly right. Um, but, you know, you, you kind of love it. And, you know, the cool thing is a lot of, you know, the folks just hung in there. You know, all the we say it all the time, all the valorous young gals and girls, you get guys and gals that are in the profession, they hung in there, um, you know, stayed the course and let history prove us right. And um, it, I guess it is kind of it is kind of redeeming on the other side of it. I'm really proud of those who toughed it out. And I got to be honest with you, I think 99% of people stuck around. Yeah. yeah Nobody yeah. actually left. No. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is what's interesting. You, I have, um, you know, again, we're a fairly large agency. We've got about 600 cops, 600 sworn folks, um, another 150 or so non-sworn folks. So, you know, we're, we're, I think we're the 60th largest agency in this, in the country, something like that. So we've got a pretty good, you know, pretty good survey of, of, of what the dynamics look like. We had some people leave the profession during all that because, you know, again, particularly in all the riots in 2020, you know, 17 hour days, you know, two weeks working at a time, sunburnt, bottles thrown at them, racist nonsense thrown at them. You know, they're in the middle of tear gas and wearing gas masks and getting having to come back day after day. There was there was there was some people who who did a gut check and said, this is not my thing. And that's OK. You know, I respect that. You know, we always respect that because, you know, it's 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 courageous, in my opinion, to to gracefully say this is not for me. So we had we had some people leave. Um, we had, the like you said, the vast majority of the folks, again, 20 year olds, 25 year olds just stayed the course, slept in cots at our headquarters building overnight and came back again day after day. Just miraculous. Um, but then I'm going to tell you what's even cooler. We had some folks here, and I'm sure it was elsewhere, that ha- had left the profession and came back during that chaos. I got w- one particular guy here in the agency. Um, he, he was a detective when he left. Um, John Matthews is his name. He left um, to pursue other avenues. And in the height of, think about this, in the height of 2020, in the height of bedlam chaos, we felt like the whole country was melting down. 
Um, you know, salaries were our salaries were still underpaid. Um, he he in that moment said, that's what I'm called to do. He was watching this stuff on the news and he realized there is nowhere else I want to be. I want to be back there on those streets, shoulder to shoulder with my brothers and sisters, helping to hold the fabric of society together. And you had guys like that, that and gals like that that came back. I remember I was, um, uh, you know, I got called as one of his background references and the background investigator said, what can you tell me about this person? I said, he's taking a significant, significant pay cut to come back to our profession in the height of chaos. Think about that. <laughs> Does anything else need to be said? Uh, this is the kind of person you want here. And he was just a microcosm of what we saw. Again, we keep saying it. The right people find their way to this profession because not to chase money or not to chase fame, but because they want to help out. They want to have hands-on experience holding things together and protecting the righteous from, you know, just hardship and darkness. It's 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 truly miraculous. And the more I think about it, we're just so ungrateful as a just as a society. We're so ungrateful. I mean, I'm saying me too. I mean, I, I can I can easily leave here and just, you know, belly ache and whine about what's wrong. But I mean, that's just a glimpse of it. We're, we're ungrateful. I think about that all the time. I think because they don't know how good they have it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You just get to go to bed. I mean, you know, we got 310,000 citizens in the city and, um, you know, a lot of them think about what we're doing while they sleep. And some of them don't. Some of them hate us without, you know, without, you know, just truly through ignorance. But either way, you just get to go home. And, you know, have a good time in the yard with your kids and, you know, enjoy your wife and make dinner and grill out. And then you just, go to, you just get to go to bed and you get to wake up tomorrow and, you know, everything is as it is. And all night long, you have 20 to 25 to 30 year olds out here running call to call to hold it all together. Like that's just we're too ungrateful for sure. I mean, even go bigger picture. I think a lot about people in other countries and significantly more unfortunate circumstances. Or they're just praying that somebody rescues them yeah. from their life. Yeah. Yeah. Of sure. literally living under complete tyranny. Yes. And threat of violence, rape. Yeah. You know, unconstitutionalities through the roof. And people sit here yeah. and they're arguing about the dumbest shit. You can always tell when I like you know, I do peruse on foxnews.com. And the reason I do that is one, I go on there essentially to look for stuff that we can comment on. Yeah. Mm. I don't let it really form opinions for me. I just look for stuff because typically you'll find pro police or at least stuff that sheds light on the epidemic of police, the police profession in this country at the moment, you know, and, and they're trying to show how ridiculous it has been. So I need to collect data from that. But yep. it's interesting lately, there hasn't been a lot of really juicy, quote unquote, and I'll say bleeding for the most part. Right. news clips or anything newsworthy yep. and they go into just anything they can find. You can always tell what's going on in, the, in this country, essentially in some sense with what's making headline news. I mean, the big stuff this past weekend yep. was Taylor Swift was here on Long Beach Island in New Jersey. <laughs> That's a good weekend <laughs> as a nation. They had, to, they had to like shut down the Island, dude. It's a big Island. Wow. So that was the big news yeah, for the country. The, yeah. That's the biggest headline that we have going down this weekend. Uh, you know, which is a which is honestly, decision. it's actually a relief in yeah. some sense that there was no mass slayings, no cops being killed. Yeah, no, um, right. you know that's a. However, that's our biggest problem at the moment. When you right. go to these other third world countries, yeah, um, I mean, people yeah. are literally hiding for their lives. Yeah, no water. Escaping. Think about that. Yeah, everybody yeah, no water. Right. right. It's it's you can, pr providing for your family. Like we think about. You know, you're right. I think our, our threshold of where we as Americans choose to lose our minds is way too low. Uh, you know, the, the Internet's slow. Oh, good. Yeah, I can't get I can't get Wi-Fi on the plane. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to pull the I'm going to pull the emergency you know slide and go to jail and lose my mind. That's just what are we doing? Um, sometimes I think we need some like we actually need some crises every once in a while. They're actually good for us. I mean, all of you look at all of history. Anytime there's been great crises is when people get very mentally healthy. Um, and come together. You think about right after 9-11, you think about yeah, the, the London bombings, you think about anything like that, you have, you see society get real cohesive. You see people get, you know, like mental health gets very, very healthy because folks realize, oh, there's, you know, there's actually real problems. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a refreshing weekend. You're right to not have, you know, to not be covering a active shooter somewhere. 
um, or, you know, a, a riot over some cop, you know, making a bad decision. But, uh, yeah, we should be grateful for it. We should pause and say, I'm grateful for this weekend, as opposed to just not even noting it. Like, you're noting it. That's important. I pause, and I'm grateful for things all the time, and especially um, my children. And yeah. I literally have been doing this thing with my daughter, namely, where I don't know, you know, she's such a doll. But I'll like look at her eyes and just stare in her eyes and she'll like stare back at me. Yes. And we'll be locked just looking at each other for like 10 seconds. Yeah. And then she'll start laughing. But <laughs> for me, I am so thankful yeah. that I get to live this life. Right. Yeah. And I'm not saying the life of like, then we fly off in my helicopter to my private jet. No, right. I'm saying this life where I get to live in a place where these kids can feel a life of joy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And almost painless compared to the rest of the world. Yeah, exactly right. And that's the, you know, those are, you know, people always say, you know, life is, you know, we tend to think life is grand and large, but life's made out of, of those, you know, those encounters, those incidents like that, those six hours where you're hanging out and playing or, you know, the, that one hour at dinner each night, like that's what life's about. But, you know, it's, it, it, it is what, it is why we choose to do this job, right? Um, I was teaching uh, some uh, active, active assailant, active shooter response for some schools and school personnel. And the second slide, uh, you know, when I build, the, build this presentation, just to picture my kids. And um, the point is like, look, let's let's realize why we even are doing this and why we do this as a profession, why we spend time to train these educators on how to respond and protect the, the greatest assets our you know, our, our greatest some of our greatest sense of, you know, sit, uh, sources of joy. And um, so that's I mean, we, we really do need to keep I, I think is it's hard to do. I mean, I understand like life is hectic. Life is busy. Life is stressful. You know, you got things pulling you, but man, if you don't, if you don't slow down, like you were saying, and just note what you have to be grateful for, it's just, I mean, it's a very shallow life. I, I, I just, I don't think it's a good plan. And I try to remind myself that as often as possible. Um, it's hard to do, man, but that's, it's what makes this, makes our existence unshallow, I think. Play this constant balance of like the obligations that I have as my role in society now, as weird as that sounds. Yeah. I realize that a lot of people are depending on me yes, and this company, everybody else here, but you know, essentially it really falls that back on me right. to be showing up a lot. But at the same time, there's four little people That's right. who also expect me to show up quite a bit. And yeah. unfortunately, um, there are many times where I sacrifice them, but there's also some times where I sacrifice this profession yeah. uh, for them. And, yeah. and it's a balance back and forth and there's no Right or wrong. And if I get it wrong, it wasn't intentional. Just, uh, you know, I'm always reminded after I teach a class that when somebody says to me, happens every so often, hey, man, um, you know, I had this traffic stop like three weeks after class. If I didn't take your fucking class or if you didn't do that podcast, yeah. I would have been killed. Yeah. And yeah. so my kids have a father now. So huge. Yeah. When I'm on a plane and I'm missing something important, yeah. which to me, almost everything's important. Yeah. But namely, something really significant. Um, I've missed many of my kids learning how to ride a two-wheeler. Yep. I've missed kids losing teeth. I've missed birthday parties. I've missed moments and kids walking. Uh, I had to watch my daughter walk via FaceTime yep. um, with their brothers cheering her on. It was a wonderful thing. It was captured, but I wasn't there to see it. Yep. Thank God for technology. Um, right. But I have to remember that there's also three kids somewhere that their parents are able to be there for them at their baseball game because of the work that we're doing. Yeah, for sure. And that's the way, you know, that's, that's how you see those things because every, you know, for, for our professional life, our home life, our family life, it is a constant battle. I mean, it's a constant, like trying to figure out how to balance all of that well. And, you know, I, I have definitely certainly not done that well over, you know, over my career. Some, at some chapters I've done it better than others. Um, but, you know, I was talking to, um, I was talking to my lieutenant the other day and we were just talking about something similar like that, like work life balance. And, you know, I've got a, I had an old mentor in policing um, that uh, I, when I got on the SWAT team years ago, he was, he was kind of my mentor. Um, he's long since retired, but he's, he's kind of like an old sage, like an old Jedi. And uh, I still talk to him and bounce ideas off of him. He's actually running a class for us here in a couple of weeks. Um, his name is Eddie Summers, old dog handler, just a grizzled sagely guy. And one of his big biggest pieces of advice, particularly in this line of work, is like, look, when you're at work, you're at work, 100 percent. 
there's no distractions. Like there's no calls from home. Like if it's a call from home, the house should be on fire. Um, because you're like this job requires such dedication and such focus, like such intense focus to do your job well and to stay safe. The other side of that, and he's always said this, when you're at home, you're at home. Like wherever you find yourself, you're hundred percent. When you're at home, you're not, you know, juggling all that, taking phone calls in the middle of the night over some parking issue and, you know, getting texts from, you know, community groups about some, you know, some, you know, challenge they've got going on. No, no, no. When you're at work, you are a hundred percent in like all in. And when you're not, you're a hundred percent not there. That's the way that you keep balance, you know, appropriate. I think, I think we, not just as cops, but as Americans, I think we make ourselves far too accessible. Um, I don't think that's wise. Um, I'm not saying like, you know, throw your cell phone in the river and go dark, you know, forever and have a P.O. box and, you know, like Ted Kaczynski. But I am saying I, I think there's I think there's wisdom in being wholeheartedly wherever you are. If you're at home, you're at home. If you're at work, you're at work. Keeping those distinctly separate and, you know, not commingling them. You you, you know, like you're talking about your time with your kids. You're not taking phone calls. You're not solving problems right there. You're un, you're unreachable. That's that. I think that's healthy. There's actually a lot of opportunities that people miss when they have an opportunity to be with their kids. Yes. And it's missed because of one thing that people tend to do with children and something that I do not do with kids. And I watch it all summer. Yeah. I'll watch it all winter. I know what you're going to say. And it's... Do, all right. What You want to write down what I'm going to say? Well, why don't you see, write down what I'm going to say, and then we'll see if we, we line up. All right. I got you. It's the introduction of alcohol. Is that where you're going to go with it? No, but I know what you're talking about. I was going to say uh, parents, like when I see dads with their cell phones in the park or at the pool and they're. Head I want to, I want, I want to, I want to refute, refute that for a second too, because yeah. I had somebody else in the past bring this up and I'm going to refute that just a tad because sometimes I am the father with the cell phone and I'll explain why. Yeah, but I, so there's two different ways to look at it. I can, you can, I can, we're paid trained observers. I can tell when a person is intently solving a problem with with haste on the phone it there's an intense intense look you can they're solving a problem they're in the they're in the moment they're going to handle it they're going to hit send and it's over that is wholeheartedly a different posture than this interesting interesting swiping swiping when i see that in the park i want to skip the cell phone across the river like i want to grab it and <laughs> yeah. throw it across the river because like you said that that window that time you can't get it back it's gone you know you can't and I, that's what i was going to defend uh, you would, will see me at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu two to three times a week. Yep. Sitting there, I actually miss some things, but the only way I am there is because I can bring my work with me. Right. So while I might miss twenty five percent of the stuff that happens, I will be there for seventy five percent because I get to glance up here and there and keep an eye on things. And yep. But you know, again, I see these people, and I, I say this to the audience here today to maybe put some framework into your brain of, you know. It really is disheartening to watch people have to get shit faced. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. everything they do with their kids with them. I I saw a girl years ago. I was working as a cop. I went to high school. Which she doesn't listen to this podcast. And I hadn't seen her since high school. It's so probably 15 years at that point. And she came in with her kid. Her daughter was like eight or 10 years old. And dude, it's like 11 in the morning. They came to see a boy band that I was watching and she reeked a booze. Oh, and I was like, yeah, yeah, it was like 11 in the morning. I'm like, and she's like, yeah, she's like, I had to stop and get some drinks here at, at Applebee's. Golly. Think about and I'm like, it. man, terrible. like you're missing this whole thing. Yep. You're missing the whole thing. You're dulling who you are. Um, you know, that's for instance, that, you know, the vision of these kids hanging out with you. Yeah. I mean, they've got all these great memories of you and, you know, you're a great sense of joy. But it takes one encounter where you, you know, maybe have a few too many and then you, you're curt with them. Right. Or you're just dull with them. You're just flatlined, you know, cause you're apprehensive about what, you know, you've been drinking and you can undo that. I mean, it, it's not, it, that is an easy sacrifice. That's a wise sacrifice for sure. And, you know, you see this, you know, I've always said like, you know, I'm not, I would not be a fan of legal prohibition, but you can make a case for it because almost all of police work, almost all of the problems that my folks are out here solving today, um, or have, have something to do with some kind of inebriating substance, and most of it is alcohol. It's interesting. So it, it's it's this discipline or not? I mean, you know, you 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 have that. You have your drink in in with your people, with your team, at your event, at your party, at your house, and you're disciplined. And then you don't when you're you know you get off the plane and you're getting ready to get picked up for your next speaking event, and you hit the the airport bar for three drinks, and then you're no, it, no. it's not wise. It's not wise. Be a professional. Be a pro. You know. Here's a little confession. Sometimes when I have a very long trip 
and it's daunting and I usually have a red eye home. This may sound a little contradictory to my machismo uh, persona that many people may see. I might have a glass of white wine when I get on the plane. There you go. Nice. Yeah. A little chilled, a little bit. Oh, you're exactly right. No, that's that's a little Chardonnay. Really the only <laughs> time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Whatever they got. You know, they don't have too many options on a plane. Yeah. And yeah. and so, yeah, I, but I won't ever drink on the way to somewhere. No, no. You, but it's got to be like nine o'clock. I'm getting on the plane. It's a three yeah. hour flight. Yep. And usually I'm snoozing by the time I have one glass of wine. I'm right. so exhausted. Little little plastic bottle of Behringer or Sutter Home or something like that. There you go. I mean, you you obviously instruct. It's very comical. And I'll give some people another behind the scenes what it feels like to be working for this company or an instructor. Something I hear from new instructors all the time, especially if they run their first first program or working out the kinks. That's why they're always free the first one around, unless you've been an existing instructor and you just want to come under the umbrella of the company, which happens. I will hear from them. They're like, dude, I'm fucking exhausted. I'm like, bro, like yeah. it is, it is so exhausting. Yeah. So to, that means they instruct. did it well. That means they did it well. That's what you want to feel like at the end of the day. Um, yeah. If if you get done with the, with the end of a, a, like a seven, eight hour training day and you just, you feel great and you, you know, your voice is not taxed and you know, you're, you're good to go another six rounds. You did, you, you did not leave it all out there. I mean, at the, at the, at the beginning of very, I taught a class last week um, on sovereign citizens, anti-government folks. And I, you know, one of my early slides just kind of gives the outline of the class. And um, one of them is, look, I'm going to give you 110% because that's the way I do everything. All I ask from you as an audience is 70%. That just means like, don't fall asleep, right? Um, we're going to make this 70, 30 entertainment to education. We're going to have a good time. You're going to learn a lot, uh, but I'm going to be waxed. I'm going to be completely tired. Um, and on the breaks, I don't want to take a lot of questions. Like that's breaks for me. Yeah, I think it's for you, but those breaks, man, I got to, I got to, I got to, you know, pause. And at the end of the day, I get home. I can't, I can't talk well. That means you left it out there. That's a professional. And that's what you ask of your folks. And that's what, you know, our folks that come, come and sit in your training. I tell, I tell the folks when I teach, I'm like, look, you could be doing anything. You don't get so many, you don't get but so many hours in life. You need to treat them with respect. I respect the fact that you chose to come in here. You could be doing anything else. And so I'm going to give you 110%. I think that's respectful. And that's how, you know, the, the best instructors like you do the, do that. Um, you, you come in, you kill it. You leave it all out there. And when you go home, you collapse. It's exactly right. Lunch is something that a lot of people will invite me to lunch. And and it's fine. I mean, I I understand. It's tiring. The, the, the I just... I can't do it. One, yep. I know what you want to get from me at lunch, which is fine. I have no issue with it. I get that I'm this guy now. Yeah. Great. It's a real honor. No shit. But don't forget, I'm not just the guy in the podcast. I'm not just the guy in Instagram. Yep. I'm not the guy in TikTok. I actually run a company too. Right. So lunchtime. And on top of that, I'm a father of four and I've got other thousands of other fucking problems in my life. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I have an hour while I'm here between my 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. finish. Right. That usually I'm on six hours sleep because I flew in the day before. Yep. So, uh, one, I have to get that stuff done. But two, you're going to be very disappointed with me when I sit at your table and you want to fire questions and get to know me. Right. And I can't talk to you. Yeah. So often I just don't, yeah. even for like, dude, it's rare that I'll actually go to lunch with somebody. Generally, it's somebody who I've known for a very long time. Yes. And I'll go to lunch with them because I have a friendship that pre-exists the yeah. classroom. That's right. And maybe I won't see them in part. They're part of the country. They'll come to class. Yeah. And uh, or there's a, a really good reason why I would go to lunch. But even at lunch, I mean, I'm just it's just how I balance things. And yeah. even at my conference, people might notice that you start seeing less of me at about the end of Wednesday. Right. I physically can't. My body is like shutting down and it's yeah. not that I'm moving. People don't know what goes on behind the scenes, right? So somebody said the other day, like, hey, you know, if you looked at that conference, you attended it, you would have thought it was flawless, but nobody had an idea that there yeah. were 25 of us behind the scenes yeah. running around like insane people yeah. the yeah. entire time. Yeah. And so on top of that, everybody comes there, you pay your VIG, you get time with every instructor, me. We were purposely and we will always go out to where everybody's going. Yes, because it means a lot, and we know that you know. But we still understand why you're here, what you want to get, and that you want to have experiences with all the instructors. Yeah, we're so honored. We'll always do that. But yeah, it beats the piss out of you. My first conference, I literally came home from Atlantic City. I sat down on my couch at twelve o'clock 
And I literally opened my eyes again. It was six in the afternoon. And then I slept another 12 hours that night. <laughs> yep. Hey, you left it on the field, man. That's what it's for. I mean, I, you know, it, it's it's the same applies. Like whatever, you know, we've told our kids this for forever. And I tell young young cops the same thing. I don't care what you do. Do whatever you get into. Just don't half-ass it. How about that? Like leave it all out there. If you become a professional educator, if you become a cop who's a trainer, you be, whatever you do, just don't halfway do it. Like go all in. It's there's no and you know what's interesting too. You collapse. You you wake up catatonic on your couch. But that is a good. That's a really it's strange to say, but that's a very good feeling. Like you earn that. You're not just tired because you're a slouch and you're not used to getting after it. You're tired because you left it all out there. And that's that's how you know you you hit the bed at the end of the day like that. You know you you truly do sleep the sleep of the innocent because you're like man I left it all out there. I, like I earned this rest. I earned this sleep. I'm exhausted. And and it makes sense. I'm not just tired. Um, I smashed it today. And that's a good feel. I love that feeling. People here, when I used to run a two-day program and do them back-to-back on the road, three, four, five, six hours, flights apart from each other. No. People here would say, how do you do it? And I have to be honest with you. I went through three police academies. Yeah. And, you know, I know that some people are like, well, what does that mean? I know, like, I was just in Minnesota. They go to, like, college. They don't actually have a former police academy with drill instruction and PT. Yeah. Um, it's very, very like watered down classroom. Mm. There is none of that. Yeah. But in New Jersey, 22 years ago, I think the best thing I ever learned was finding myself in my first police academy because it was very, very hard. Yeah. And I could tell you my third day, I considered quitting. Yeah. I had never been through something like that in my life. Nobody prepared yeah. me. And I was overwhelmed and beaten. And I did some soul searching and said, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to go back. And to this day, that's probably one of the top three best decisions of my life. Yes. Because oddly enough, the next day was easier. Yeah, that's it. So, it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes like just hanging in there. You know, that, that's a, that's an old mantra that everybody passes around, you know, just make it to lunch or just make it to the next evolution or the next day. But it's true. I mean, you almost always find that you're tougher than you think. And, you know, hanging in there, resilience is like a muscle. Um, you know, you exercise it incrementally. You hang out, hang out one more day. I'm coming back tomorrow. I don't know about next month, but I'm coming back tomorrow. And then you make it through the next day. You're tighter with your team. You've accomplished another day. You've learned another skill. Maybe you've mastered something that you were poor at yesterday. Um, and that's, you know, honestly, that's the best way to approach anything. It's like, I'm going I'm to give it all I can today. And, you know, and then we'll do it again tomorrow. That's it. Well, in that academy, I learned that I had way more gas than I ever thought I had. I had a reserve tank I had no idea about. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what that's, that's what it taught power. me. Yeah. That, and that's a superpower, man. Um, you know, we, we I teach our kids the same thing. We talk about that all the time. Like, you, you know, if you can go, you know, every, we, we, we always tell the kids like coaches love hustle and they love like kids that get after it. And, you know, on a break, on a water break in the middle of your whatever volleyball tryout, all the other kids are sitting down drinking. If they see you up, you know, slamming the ball, walking around, moving around, like that sticks out because you're giving it your all, right? You you, you can go one more whatever minute, hour, day. It's always the case, and and that's just and and that's so cool when you see either a young kid or a, or a young cop realize that they push through it, like they entered the academy and they couldn't run whatever three miles, and then by the end you're on these group runs for five and six miles. And they can't even imagine not being able to do two miles like they can't imagine that. So it's it's um, like that's super impressive when you push them through. But it does take, uh, you know, you, you don't just you don't you can't just often do that by yourself. You need the encouragement and prodding of a of a, a sagely type individual. Right. Somebody that's a little farther down the road. That's why you have PTOs. That's why you have, you know, salty old sergeants that tell them, look, you can do it. Like, let's go. Let's go. Um, I, lo- I love watching that stuff. That's great. My kids bear witness to my work ethic. And I don't give credit out a lot, especially to my parents, but my father worked a lot, probably more than he probably could have worked a little smarter, a little less, but Mm -hmm. it is what it is. And yeah, I really didn't have a relationship with my father on a respectful adult level until I was about 22. Mm -hmm. And then we were, we were cool from that point forward, really not too much friction. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, they were always, my father's always interested in the work. Uh, he liked my father, big, big cop buff. Yeah. Anyway, I called yeah. him one time. He said, you know, uh, or he called me. So what do you got going on? He says, ah, you know, I worked last night. I got, uh, I got up this morning. I had to go work a construction job. That goes till five. And then I'm going to work tonight. I got to go home, take a shower. I don't think I'm able to, able to catch a nap. But I got to go back to work at this community center tonight for a four hour detail. 
Yeah. I'm a hustler, right? So I like I, oh, yeah. I, I I like the money. I like all like I just like to win. Yep. And I'm like, damn, um, I'm exhausted. Because how much sleep did you get last night? I said, like six and a half, seven. Yeah. Just finished my four. And he's like, uh, you know, then it's very funny that you're complaining. He's like, you know how many times I got two hours of sleep and went back to work? Well, and you're on the phone complaining to me because you got <laughs> He's like, hey kiddo. He goes, he goes, hey kiddo. Hey, you know, I did this my whole fucking life. So don't, don't, you're, you're, maybe you want to go complain to somebody else, but you're talking to the wrong guy. That's, yeah. My father, well, people will say, my family, like, oh, you have your father's work ethic. Maybe. Uh, yeah. I think we're completely different people for the most part. Right. Maybe. I think I was just one of those people who has a very strong work ethic. Sure. Yep. Yeah. 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 And that's a gift. I mean, honestly, man, it's a gift. If if you think there's there's one thing that's the rarest commodity in the United States right now, it's work <laughs> work ethic. Sure. Uh, sure. Our three kids right now started a mowing. You know, they're 10, 12, 14. They started a mowing business last summer. And, um, you know, their their little checking accounts are significant at this point. Like a lot of Legos can be purchased at this point with their checking yeah. account. But I tell them all the time, like if, if you will sweat and you will hustle, you will never, never be poor. You will always ha- you will always right. be like needed and necessary. And if you, you know, just the idea that you can hustle and you can work harder than other than other folks, you, you'll you always win. I mean, it, it's it's easy. Um, and so, yeah, that that from your dad, whether, you know, though it was translated poorly, it sounds like, um, you you know, you saw him, you saw him getting up, you saw him hustling, you saw him coming always. in from work. Yeah. And that's a gift, man. I mean, you know, I can't imagine I'm this and I come from, you know, my dad had the same work ethic. I can't imagine coming home and my dad just be like taking a nap in the middle of the, the day or like, like that's so such an alien idea. Like my dad would get home from work. He'd be max. He'd be worn out because he worked hard. And then, you know, mm-hmm. we'd eat and, and go to bed and he'd knock it out again. Like that's a gift to you and me. And um, yeah, it, it's interesting that, you know, that, that it stuck, that, that it adhered for us, you know? Hey guys, follow us on all social media platforms to include Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook group. We have so much information going on every single day and we don't want you to miss out on any of that stuff. So check it out. Go give us a follow. I had a lot of questions and a lot of topics we could have talked about, but you know, as this comes to a close, it's not the close of Captain Corey Flowers now. Uh, maybe one day Chief Corey Flowers. We'll see. Yeah, but what uh, kind of feedback have you been getting from doing this podcast? Do people actually listen to it that you know? Yeah, I, you know, I didn't know. Um, I've, you know, everybody's got their own habits. I've got podcasts that I listen to. I, you know, I, I listen to this podcast now since I've become involved and gotten a lot out of a lot of the speakers. But yeah, a lot of, um, I'll, I'll call it like the younger generation here at the agency of like go getters or is in my is what I've seen is who tracked the podcast. I mean, I've got, you know, young guys that, you know, they've known me. I, you know, I train them at the range. I train, you know, I help with training in the academy. I'm always around. Um, but for whatever reason now, they're like, hey, I heard you on the podcast. Like that's a like it's, you know, and it's real, it's real interesting. And the, you know, a lot of these guys are like. Truly, you know, some of them have have paid their own way to go to your conferences. You know, they're they're asking me, you know, can we get some of these classes here? Can you can you find out like can could we can I want to get in the in this class here? And and it's interesting, man, to 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 see because like we always say, you know, I I if I if I had my preference, I am not, whether it's this agency or any agency, we do not want just people, right? Uh, a lot of the old, you know, business books say people are the most important resource, and I just wholeheartedly disagree with that. Particularly in our line of work, what we want is the right people, right? We don't want people. We don't want numbers of people. We want the right people. So you got, you know, P ones, which for us is folks that have been here like less than three years, and they're out here wanting to know about interdiction, and they're wanting to know about how to spot guns on folks in the street. They want to know how to do those roadside interrogations where you know you use theatrics and the dynamics of speech to get confessions. Um, they, they're looking to the sources and one of the great places they go is to street cop and street cop podcasts. Cause they listen to a lot and they glean and they study, they study a lot of these topics like an MBA student is studying today to get a, to get a graduate degree. It's really interesting. And so I've enjoyed those conversations. Um, you know, for, for me and for me and you, we're just having, we're just talking, we're just talking about stuff. I mean, I tell them a lot of times, yeah, Dennis is a great dude. We just, we don't ever have a plan. We just hit record and he says, what do you want to talk about? And we always talk about cool things. And those are the best conversations anyway. But I, I have, you know, a lot of times guys will come in here and they're wearing their street cop hats and different things. That they, <laughs> it's great, man. And I see it and I'm like, oh, it's interesting, man. They're, they're all in, they're big fans. Um, because honestly, there's so much, there's a lot of, I'll call it like really cheap, 
regurgitated, you know, bullcrap police training that exists. I mean, you can go and, go and Google and Wikipedia, all manner of stuff. Um, but as far as like proactive, in, uh, innovative, aggressive, assertive training, there's not a lot of it. Um, and so, you know, these the, the right folks, ga- guys and gals go to this source, which has been neat to watch for sure. I wonder how you can train cops without the word proactive in it when essentially the core of our job is to be proactive. And I mean the sense of in every way, shape and form, you see that kid crying on the corner. You should be proactive to go put your arm around that kid and say, is everything okay? You you know, even if you're in the community affairs division, you should be proactive to go and make sure the people at the old folks home are all right. You should be proactive in the school. If you're an SRO to form and bond relationships and continue to make sure that things are improving and getting better. That's right. So, when you have a lackadaisical training company or a training that people go to, yeah. one, it's just brutal for the end user. Two, yeah. Yeah. I just don't understand what the mindset is behind it. And I think that word proactive gets misconstrued because even in the business world, any training you're going to is training to help you improve and be proactive yes. in, in developing your business or your professionalism. So it's very, very, but I have received a fuck ton of feedback from these podcasts with you people really really like you well i mean that's cool and you know whatever that's great i i I like you know the content the subject of what we're talking about is you know it's just and i don't know you know unfortunately you can't i don't think you can gain a lot of this type of stuff we're talking about in five six years It's, it's just honestly like old man old cop talk is what we're doing here but yeah you know the idea of being proactive you know, if we say one thing on the range, if we say one thing on the shoot house, if we say one thing in the training scenarios, we say a thousand times, we're constantly telling folks, find a job, find something to do. There's always something to do. If you're on a takedown, there's always something to do. Look around, find a problem, solve the problem, right? I mean, it's continually. And that's that's being proactive. I told you when I first took over this division, one of the things I told all 70 folks under my command here is I want all y'all to be problem solvers. Solve your own problems. Figure it out. If you have to call your boss, I want you to have a solution and you offer it. And as long as it's, you know, not way crazy, uh, he or she's going to say, do it. Uh, We want you to be proactive. I want you to solve your own problems. That's what police work is at at its essence, is just proactively solving problems. I I really, you know, the, the least enjoyable police work is the reactive call, you know, report taking type stuff, you know, two hours after the B&E and you get there and you document it. That's not, it's not really police work. That's, you know, that's documentation for insurance and different things, but like proactive policing is what makes cities safer. And it's what makes a lot of these young folks that track this podcast fulfilled in their professional capacity. Um, You know, learning how to be proactive and getting the green light to be able to do that. The first thing I wrote when we started talking earlier was this, and it's, I wrote all cops want to do is do police work. <laughs> yeah. They it. just want to be cops. And if you just let them be cops and let them do police work and you give them the adequate tools, resources, and training to go out yeah. and do the work and you give them the administrative support, they're going to solve your problems for you. Yeah. But you got to let them off the leash. And unfortunately, we know that probably the biggest issue in this profession is the leadership. Yeah. And yeah. there's there's no question about it. And I got to tell you, my friends like you and other people who are great leaders, who are in the inner circles of things, who do have a real good pulse on what leadership is, mm-hmm. when they go to these other meetings or these associations, yeah, you know, I'm like, what do you, what is a guy like you? And this has nothing to do with you because I don't want you to answer this for your own professional standards yeah. and, and, and career. Uh, but yeah. I'll say to them, like, you know, what does a guy like you feel like in a room like that? Right. And they're like, I literally got to this level because I can't stand the people that I'm in these rooms with. <laughs> and they have just lost so much fucking touch with reality. Yeah. And yeah. They, how they see, we get, there's a guy in New Jersey who was teaching leadership that everybody got sent to. And mm. all his whole leadership thing, I, I heard, listen, believe me, I heard it's fucking horrendous. I don't think anybody even goes to it anymore. And you know, it starts out with like discipline. How do you discipline people? How do you track discipline? You know, like, and, and like, so if that's your mindset <laughs> and you're a leader, you fucking missed already you've yeah. lost yeah we don't we don't solve problems through discipline right that's just not how it works right everybody yeah. can be yeah. reasoned with and talked to is right. there going to be these times where you realize there's a problem that yeah. has to get resolved yeah sure but like it doesn't mean with one broad stroke of a pen you encompass everybody under the same umbrella that if you fuck up even though you might be good yeah if you fuck up i got to do what i did to him because it's only fair 
Yeah. You think about a guy, think about the kind of person that aspires to discipline folks. That is the, that is the exact person you do not want to have that authority. Like you should be as a, as a leader, you should be aspiring to motivate, to drive, to encourage. Um, and then discipline is an unfortunate part of that, but you gotta, you gotta be confident at it too, but to aspire to, man, I can't wait till I can discipline folks. God, that is so, that is so unhealthy. Terrifying dude. Yep. It sure is. One of the, one of the worst things of being an owner of a company is, you know, first of all, I, I want to say this, that there is nobody here that I can't talk to like an adult. However, there have been times as I've learned through my life that there are people I can't even talk to. Yeah. And so for that reason, those people fail to thrive in my environment because I cannot, the conversation years ago, and I'm like, I can't come in here and be a kindergarten teacher. Right. For 35 year old adults. Yep. So yep. I'm proud to say right now that yes, we have a meeting once a week. I got to give guidance a little bit of where the ship's going this week. Yep. But there's not one person here that I have to micromanage. That's and that's correct. by design. Yes. And so right. everybody here loves this place because I've had to do the work of getting rid of those who are disrupting yes. what we have here. It's a very yep. special thing. It's very, yep. very wonderful place to come to. Yeah, getting rid of the, getting rid of the wrong people is, I'll say, more important than even finding the right people. Yeah, you got right. Go. They got to go. Sometimes you got to be severe, unfortunately. But yeah, this is not a good fit. Um, you know, it's however you want to view that. It's not you. It's a, I, I, whatever. It's not a good fit. You don't you don't track with the vision. You know, best of luck. That's okay. Now you're disrupting other people here. We had people, and then what's the crazy thing is you get two of those people together and they find each other. Forget it. Now you got now you got an army forming. That's right. Yeah. They're not oh. twice as bad. They're like, they, it compounds. They're like 50 times more of a problem. Yep. And then they, then they start looking to recruit other folks. Oh yeah. Toxic. They got, yeah. You, you gotta get, you gotta dig that out for sure. Yeah. That's quick. Yeah. yeah. Quick. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that that's, that's huge. We've talked about it before you and I like, you, you know, you figure out who those people are, you get them on the ship, you get them what they need, you unleash them. And the other folks like you doggedly protect your team. Uh, if somebody's, you know, cancerous, they're toxic. They gotta go. It's not a not a lot of like thinking that needs to be done. They're they're not a good fit. They gotta go. Well, people are very uncomfortable with having uncomfortable conversations. Yeah, I know. That's unfortunate. And that's I think that's that's one of the big problems. Like, you know, I think, yeah, those conversations are tough, but they gotta happen. They gotta happen. In the long run, you know, the, the passive aggressive nonsense that'll pile up if you don't, like just be honest. Like you're not a good fit. You don't fit with the vision. Best of luck. That's it. I had a friend of mine who uh it was going pretty bad pretty quickly. And it was outside forces that were affecting our friendship mm. and uh, causing misbehavior on that person's side. So I brought that person into my office, not an employee, actually a friend. I was like, hey, listen, it's Saturday. Why don't you come over here? And mm. uh, I think we need to get bloody. And mm. so came in, closed the door, beat the piss out of each other for two and a half hours yep. and walked out limping with broken arms and broken legs and yep. bloody faces. Yeah. And I got to tell you, to this day, I am proud to say that our bond has never been stronger. That's a big deal. And and it was the right person to have that conversation with because both walked in with the intention of fixing this thing. And it was worth it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of people don't have the courage to do that. There's a there's a Bible verse that says something to the effect of uh, wounds from a friend can be trusted. And that's what you're talking about there. Like, you know, you have a certain permission. Y'all close the door. What's the problem? Tell me the problem. Here's my perception. And you duke it out. But he's a friend. He's trusted. And you you guys wound each other and duke it out and come out with, you know, metaphorical black eyes. It's better uh, because he's given you he's given you his perspective. You've given him your perspective and it's better. It's clean. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And um, it's never fun. And I sometimes even to my own detriment, try to avoid tough conversations. But I got to tell you, they are so paramount. And although they might hurt in the moment, I think people respect them yeah. significantly in the yeah. long run. Yeah. Even if it's a hard word, man, folks respect the truth. The, uh, we'll say it forever. The truth is your friend. It's always your friend. Whatever comes as a result of you telling the truth, even if it's rowdy in the meantime, it's going to be the best case scenario. That's true. Yeah, yeah. There, listen, bro, you you and I know, like, <laughs> I'm down to have a conversation on things I talk about. If you want to talk about a topic I have no interest in talking about or having no business talking about it. I'm not getting involved. Yeah. But anything that I say, I will stand and before you and have the conversation. I'm yeah. not afraid to back up the things that I'm saying. So things that I've said on this podcast, I'm not perfect, but I believe in them. Yep. 
That's exactly right. Yeah. No, you got to hope, hope. We always say hold strong opinions loosely, but you got to have an opinion. <laughs> like you got to stand on something, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Listen, brother, it's been great. I got 25 minutes for our next podcast kicks off. Good work, pal. Good to talk to you as always. Be safe, dude. You're the best, brother. Yeah, and, and we'll put this together again. And Corey, you know, we got we to gotta get together some one of these fucking days. Yeah, maybe that conference, man. You got your conference coming up. That'd be cool. You got to come to that. Yeah, that'd be cool. You're the okay. captain, bro. Fucking allocate some funds over there, huh? Yeah, I can make it happen for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're Listen, it's not some conference. Like, they're going to have a good time and all that. But, like, your people will leave with a enormous amount of training. I mean, really ROI on our train. We had a guy taught a class in Cleveland last year. Next day I get a message from him because we left Cleveland, went back home tonight. This morning, one of our guys had to go back to work this morning. He had $136,000 on a traffic stop, first traffic stop. No kidding. Because I had to beg the chief for 1500 bucks to get five guys to the class. And we already got back a hundred X on our fucking investment. That's an easy conversation. You like that conversation. That's great. I mean, and he said to me, he goes, bro, this changed everything for us at the moment. Yes. We haven't had money to figure out how to buy like new patrol cars and new patrol rifles. And now we can, we know in nine or 15 months, we're going to get this money back and we're going to be able to buy patrol rifles for the whole division. Game changer, bro. That's awesome. Yeah, Yeah, that's good. So you'll get, you you, you will, it's not just about hanging out. It really is a lot. And bro, you will see 2000 cops sitting down with pens and pads. And they nobody's napping, nobody's sleeping, even hungover. Love it. I love it. Yeah, that's that's a glimpse of heaven right there. I love that. That's great. All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon. See you, bud. Hey guys, check out our upcoming training at streetcop.com. Don't forget, we have 50 instructors nationally teaching a variety of topics. These are the best classes you're going to experience in your career. We make sure of it. You're going to love it. I guarantee you, you're going to be thankful that you went. Check us out at streetcop.com for all upcoming classes in your area.